Hi there, my Why Religion friends. Professor Anthony Sweat here from BYU Church History and Doctrine. Welcome to another great episode of the podcast. Many of you have likely visited or heard about Las Vegas, Nevada. Some of our listeners likely, in fact, live there right now. Well, when you hear Las Vegas, what comes to your mind? Most likely, the Las Vegas Strip, casinos, gambling, buffets, entertainment, and the like. Am I right? I remember as a kid, the first time I visited Las Vegas, I was 12 years old and I went there to play in a basketball tournament. And to get to our team hotel, we had to walk through a casino in the lobby. As a simple Utah boy, I had never seen so many lights, slot machines and cigarettes, nor heard so many noises and clinking coins, all emanating from one place in my entire young life. The experience is seared into my memory. And for most of us, that's the Las Vegas that we know. But we need to know something more than that about Las Vegas, particularly about its roots that had nothing to do with casinos, but everything to do with communities, including Latter-day Saint communities. Many do not know that the Latter-day Saint pioneers were part of the first communities who helped settle Las Vegas in 1855. For decades, Las Vegas served as a way station to resupply immigrants between California and Utah. Although known today as Sin City, originally Las Vegas could have been called Saint City. Professor Fred Woods of BYU Church History and Doctrine has recently published a great book through the University of Nevada Press called Bright Lights in the Desert, the Latter-day Saints of Las Vegas, that chronicles the history and influence of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Las Vegas. You know, there's over 100,000 Latter-day Saints in the area, and at one time there were more churches in Vegas than any other uh, city in America. So, you know, they care about their families. This is a vibrant religious community. In this episode, Dr. Woods helps us see how Las Vegas was and still is, a place where faithful Latter-day Saints have lived and worshipped and influenced the culture and community of Las Vegas for good. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Ryan Sharp of BYU Ancient Scripture sat down with his colleague, Professor Fred Woods of BYU Church History and Doctrine, to discuss Dr. Woods' new book publication on the history of the Latter-day Saints in Las Vegas. This is part of Dr. Woods' larger Saints by State research project, where he is researching foundational events and people that helped establish the church in each state in the United States. In part one of this interview, Dr. Woods will discuss why he wrote this book and did this research, giving us a great summary of the development of the church in the greater Las Vegas metro area, and how Latter-day Saints have been involved in the positive development of the culture and community in that area. So here is Ryan Sharp interviewing Dr. Fred Woods. I want to actually kind of set the stage by reading a paragraph a somewhat large paragraph from the preface, because I feel like that will give us a a pretty good uh, overview of where we're going to go with this. So uh, in the preface, you write, Bright Lights in the Desert, Latter-day Saints in of Las Vegas, illuminates the tremendous influence of Las Vegas saints uh, that they have wielded in politics, education, business, entertainment, cultural refinement, and family stability in their community. Chapters 1 and 2 outline general Las Vegas Latter-day Saint history, commencing with the erection of the old Mormon Fort Settlement and moving through the establishment of early Las Vegas stakes to provide a historical base for the remainder of the book. By this point, the church had formed solid roots in Vegas soil. Chapters 3 through 7 highlights subjects 
topically to demonstrate how the saints have borne fruit uh, through a look at various branches of their influence in society. The chapters still provide adequate historical background from the latter half uh, of the 20th century to the present. The city of Las Vegas and its neighboring cities of North North Las Vegas, Henderson, Boulder City, constituting the greater uh, desert metropolis, uh, are considered. I have utilized numerous primary sources coupled with scores of interviews. This book demonstrates the Latter-day Saint contribution to the beauty, stability, and spirit of the Las Vegas region. Along with other like-minded local citizens of varied faiths and cultures, the Latter-day Saints have made a concerted effort to enhance education, strengthen families, and energize communities throughout the Vegas uh, locality. Uh, I, I know that was a little bit long, but I really think it's a great summary and kind of an overview of where we're going to go. So let's let's maybe start with the history. So this constitutes chapters one and two, um, and and uh, I, I know that we could spend an entire episode of our podcast on any one of these chapters. Uh, so maybe just kind of highlight the things that you feel are most important looking at the history of the saints in Las Vegas. Okay, just before doing that, Ryan, I want to uh, I'm, I'm thinking of something that's very important, <clears throat> and that is just uh, the sin of ingratitude is a crime more despicable than revenge. And I wanted to point out that the person who wrote the foreword to this book, to get it beyond the reef, beyond the LDS community, into the city at large, was Professor Mike Green, mm. who is um, a UNLV professor of history. I think he would be considered by most to be the very best uh, academic with the city of Las Vegas, but also the state of mm. Nevada. <clears throat> He's a wonderful uh, friend. He's a uh, Jewish, hard-hitting academic. And um, so, as I mean, as you begin the book and you see the forward, I'm just so grateful that Mike launched it into this history. And also, I wanted to mention that this book is a, a companion film to a documentary with the same name. I, me I mentioned about 85 film interviews, and I did that with Latter-day Saint filmmaker Martin Anderson. So the two of them together, it's now being shown on, on BYU television, but I think anyone that reads the book would want to see the film to see things, you know, a distillation with, with hundreds of images and to see clips of people speaking uh, the talking heads. But <clears throat> going back to your question, in the 20th century, uh, the church starts to grow through the efforts of Newell K. Levitt. He was an employee for the Clark For Forwarding Company in 1912, and as a good as a clerk, he was delivering goods to customers throughout the Vegas region. And while wa working in the store and on deliveries, he probed to see if customers knew any Latter-day Saints. And then he'd collect the names, and then he eventually he started a Sunday school in his own home, which becomes a branch by 1915. We had a ward by 1924, and uh, it, it's interesting. The, the great LDS scholar Leonard, Singh, Leonard J. Arrington uh, talked about that with, uh, and I, I'm going to quote Arrington, Utah suffered immensely from the post-World War I depression that began in 1921. The consequence was that thousands of Utahns began a migration out of state, state seeking opportunities to earn a living, and, and many came to to uh, Nevada. So we'll see like in the 30s, you have the Hoover Dam that's being built, and then we're moving into various jobs, including education. Uh, but one thing I found so interesting during this period from <clears throat> the, 20, the, the dawn of the 20th century all the way to about 1970, as I was surprised, I did not find any anti-Mormon literature. And I went through the local newspapers. I spent about 10 weeks full time searching the word Mormon or Latter-day Saint, uh, various words to draw it out. But I was, I was amazed. And what I did find is this, uh, the saints were highly respected, ecumenical type things of going to vacation Bible school together and uh, meeting for whether it's Christmas or Easter, these kinds of things. But by the 50s, the decade of the 50s, by 54, the Las Vegas Stake is created from the Moapa Stake. 
And then in 56, we have the Lake Mead steak. By 1960, we have the North Las Vegas steak. And, um, and now there's like 27 steaks and an average of 4,000. Uh, members of the church per stake in the Las Vegas metro area. So that's really, in a nutshell, that early history uh, taking us up to uh, that, that first century. Well, very good. That's really helpful, especially now we can situate the, the next part of the discussion uh, against that backdrop. So let's let's dive in then. So in chapters three and four of the book, you talk about uh, education, cultural refinement, business, um, what did you learn in your research about each of these? And, and maybe specifically, uh, you, you identify how Latter-day Saints have been involved in each of these. Uh, walk us through that. What did you learn? Well, first of all, I think a buzzword is Howard Hughes, um, the billionaire. And so in the area of business, um, Hughes had a group of Latter-day Saint guys led by Bob Gay, and he... He, it was called the Mormon Mafia, but these were clean-cut guys, smart. But Hughes made this interesting comment about them, and keep in mind they're working for him in Vegas. He said this, I think the Mormons have the most integrity of any group in the country, end of quote. And, uh, you know, we see it throughout Vegas. Their values are woven uh, throughout the area. It didn't really make any difference what it was. Uh, e. Perry Thomas was a banker that came down from Salt Lake City and ends up having a very important role um, in the infrastructure of the economy. And his business partner is Jerry Mack. So it's these two, a Jewish uh, guy that specialized in real estate and Perry that specialized in banking. So they really uh, were able to really create like a dynasty, so to speak. And many of the casinos are being funded by these guys, okay? But it kind of also keeps the Pandora in the box because they set up regulations where it isn't, it's by the time these guys get into things, uh, the mafia is no longer running Vegas. Uh, or at least they're they're being, you know, a, a bit regulated, so to speak. And so, I think it's an intern uh, an important point in uh, kind of keeping things in check. As far as education, I mean, Latter Day Saint moms were so involved in PTA, and um, I love to read these stories where they're whether it's, it's sex education or whatever the topic is, they're just making sure that there's proper values uh, arising and there's some amount of uh, structure, not only for Latter-day Saint kids, but for Protestants, Catholics, just people of faith, uh, that it doesn't uh, go haywire. They're demanding that billboards are cleaned up so parents don't have to throw a quarter on the ground to keep their children's eyes from looking at them, as one woman told me. And uh, I did some research on this, and I found it so interesting that by far the most women who have won Nevada Mother of the Year have been Latter-day Saints. Again, only 6% of the state, but this has been the majority, and, and it's significant. I was also intrigued that nearly three dozen schools in Clark County, uh, Southern Nevada, are named after LDS educators. They were respected in the marketplace, as uh, most businessmen and businesswomen had these high values of morality, honesty, and a strong work ethic. One of my favorite areas of study when we think about education was the church educational system, which is now called SNI or Seminary and Institute. So, what we did, we did some filming at Shadow Ridge High School, and we interviewed. Uh, various people, both LDS and non-LDS, but shout out what the Latter-day Saints would do is as soon as they heard that a high school was going to be built, they would quickly purchase land as close as they could to the high school, which was very smart, in order that the, the kids didn't, that they could walk to seminary. So, <clears throat> 
anyway, you have this LDS chapel right next to our stake center, I should say, right next to Shadow Ridge High School, where seminary is held early morning, not release time, early morning. When the students come onto the campus, I heard this from various people, both the teachers and the administrators would use words like this, that they could feel their influence coming. And they're often the students that are the, whatever, the student body, president, the, the student council. Anyway, they're involved in government, uh, many valedictorians. And so uh, they're recognized clearly, these LDS youth as being leaders. And as far as the Institute is concerned, uh, one former Las Vegas Institute director I interviewed, David Roberry, vividly remarried. This is going remembered back in the like the mid 90s that the former interim UNLV president, Ken, uh, Kenny uh, Gwen, asked him, would you train the student body officers at UNLV using your student council? He said, I know these young people would need that. So Roberry and his institute council happily consented and provided you know, this proactive leadership training for the UN, UNLV uh, student body. And another example that I really love is outsiders, uh, bricklayers particularly, they're noticing these Latter-day Saint students coming out of the building, uh, and their words that they said had a, uh, a glow. So the workmen actually ended up coming over to the Institute and asking why these kids have such a glow that are coming out of the, out of the Institute building. Uh, the result was that one of the brick bricklayers later joined the church and the other became a great friend. So there's, um, their presence is, is felt uh, in many places. That's neat. So as far as cultural refinement, this is one of the things that you had mentioned yeah. earlier. Zion's Youth Symphony and Chorus, everybody should look this up on the web. This is an impressive group of young people. And, and um, I, I love that. that. That was highlighted on that documentary, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so it, I think it, you know, it, it demonstrates not only are Latter-day Saint youth Christians, uh, but they've brought a spirit to the Vegas env environment that's palpable, and they're inspiring uh, performances. And they aren't just LDS kids, kids of good faith, led by Latter-day Saints, as well as those that are directing them. But this is just one example. I also think of even on the strip, you know, where Donnie and Marie Osmond performed for uh, about a dozen years, squeaky clean shows. But three times during that period, they were awarded the best show in Vegas in stark contrast to other performers that didn't have as high as standards. And we can't forget Gladys Knight a prominent Latter-day Saint who's performed on the strip, active Latter-day Saints, as well as LDS rocker Brandon Flowers. So the Latter-day Saints, again, are recognized um, in this cultural refinement service. They provided a tremendous amount of service to the community, and they knew how to join hands with other good people of other faiths. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, that's one thing that I saw in going through my study that they were they were working together uh, with the with the community to keep the strip on the strip, or in other words, Pandora in the box. So uh, I, I interviewed a number of people that one of my uh, favorites is uh, Judy uh, Brailsford Marcucci and Lisa DeMeo, who uh, joined hands in order to keep, gambling out of the neighborhoods, as one example. Heidi Gresham Wixom and other good Christian women helped to shut down a topless barber shop uh, by getting an ordinance passed. And, uh, and also Heidi led the way of getting rid of smutty billboards. So, and, you know, so w one of the things that I found interesting was that you know, we think of Las Vegas, again, as Babylon and a party area, and people will actually, I heard this in a number of interviews, both with LDS and non-LDS, they'd be asked, you know, uh, you know, like, do you live, does your family live in a hotel? I mean, they're just, I mean, really ignorant of, of the, this is a family community. I mean, this strip is on this strip, 
But, you know, there's over 100,000 Latter-day Saints in the area. And at one time, there were more churches in Vegas than any other uh, city in America. So, you know, they care about their families. This is a vibrant religious community. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place for you to check out. Usually, I bring your attention to a new book that the RSC has recently published, but today I want to simply highlight all the research that's available to you for free on their website. The RSC was originally formed under the direction under the then Dean of Religion of BYU, Jeffrey R. Holland. The RSC is a vital research and publication arm of religious education. It exists to seek out, encourage, and publish faithful gospel scholarship by producing and disseminating high-quality peer-reviewed works. Many of these peer-reviewed works are available for free, as I mentioned, through their search bar on their website. You can read peer-reviewed articles from the Religious Educator Journal, past Sperry Symposium volumes or Church History Symposium volumes, and also Easter conferences. You can also get links to Come Follow Me resources, and also great videos from BOE Professor Roundtable discussions to support your scripture study. Go to their website and check out their resources available to you at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Fred Woods discuss his recent book publication on the history of the Latter-day Saints in Las Vegas. In part two of our religion, we'd like to focus a little bit more on application and how this research can help us to live, learn, or love aspects of the restored gospel. So in part two, Dr. Woods will take us that direction by discussing the saints' focus on family, politics, and community service, and especially the beacon of the temple in that area. I'd love to to get your thoughts. Uh, you, you you mentioned there really is this emphasis on the uh, community focusing on family. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that as well as um, kind of shifting to uh, elected officers and then any other insights you have on community service and and the role that church leaders and church members have had in the community. Yeah, well, it, it's. One of the most wonderful things uh, that happened through all of this is that I noticed from different non-LDS journalists, and I interviewed several, that they the the focus on family was uh, was tremendous. Let me let me give you three examples. One uh, Las Vegas uh, journalist, well known, uh, John Smith, noted, "You cannot say that Las Vegas would be anywhere near where it is today without." that tremendous influence of some very dedicated people who happen to be Mormon in faith and practice. I don't think there's an area of Las Vegas that has not been touched by the LDS faith. Practicing and organizing in the community, focusing on public education values that are so important to a community if you're going to put down roots. I think the greatest contribution is stability to have members of the community that are stabilizing influence cannot be overstated, it's so important. So with this idea of family, uh, John Smith clearly recognized it. Another hard-hitting journalist, John Ralston, uh, described the impact of Latter-day Saints and their families this way. He said their influence has been pervasive because it's so broad and so deep. They were known for standing up men of moral rectitude. And then Brian Greenspun, editor, CEO, and, and owner of, and owner of the, lo- the local newspaper, The Las Vegas Sun, observing that although the LDS population of Las Vegas and, Car- and Clark County was only a small percentage, it seemed it to, to him, he told me, to be like 30 or 40 percent, not in terms of the size of the population, but in the influence. He enumerated the commitment to governance, the commitment to civic engagement, the commitment to charitable endeavors always outsized as compared to the rest of the community. The LDS community was vibrant across every facet, politically, public service, charitable, no group of people 
came even close. And then really, and just adding this, when you mentioned the issue of family, former Nevada State Senator Richard Bryant, a Protestant, he made this comment. The LDS community has had a profound impact on Southern Nevada, dating back to the early founding of the Mission of 55 here in Vegas and the growth and the growth of the community largely in the early days. They brought with them strong family values. They brought with them the virtue of hard work, discipline, all of which is part of a value system, but always it was family. Family was first, not second, not third, and the family structure impresses all. We don't understand necessarily their theological roots to the belief, but the family values, the civic responsibility. So <clears throat> let me go back then and, and launching in. I mean, and keep in mind, all of these people I'm quoting here, they're not Latter-day Saints. Protestants, Jewish, um, uh, you know, uh, newspaper editors and things. It's, it's, this is, I think, significant. But let's go back to elected officials. Mark Hutchison, former state senator and lieutenant governor of Nevada, observed along with filing to run for elected office, there was effective uh, networking. And what would happen is Latter-day Saints would say, you know, come embrace my candidates, candidacy because you embrace my values. And I, I found it fascinating. At one time, there was uh, about 30 percent of the elect elected officials in Southern Nevada and Las Vegas were Latter-day Saints. And so that some of the massive. examples— That is huge. It, that is huge. And in fact, Elder Neil A. Maxwell came down and asked— uh, one of my friends, why is this so high? And, you know, she was explaining this. I, I guess what's different to me about Utah um, as opposed to Southern Nevada is that we're both busy going to church and going to, and, you know, to um, being involved with our jobs. The Vegas Saints, I think by far, are more involved with the community. It is not gray down there. It's either black or white, and they know if they're not involved in the community. Things are going to slide in one way. Things are going to slide, and the, the Pandora is going to get out of the box, or the sewage of the strip is going to seep into neighborhoods, and they, they just won't allow it. But let me give you some examples. In the latter half of the 20th century, we find Clark County commissioners, U.S. senators, including Harry Reid that I interviewed this past year before his passing, state senators, mayors, uh, police officers, and even the federal courthouse is named after Latter-day Saint Judge Lloyd George, uh, who is a U.S. district court judge. So, you know, these things are significant. Very good. Well, and, and with that, I, I'm, I'm still kind of blown away at that 30% of elected officers are, are members of the church. What about maybe more of the grassroots? Like what, what's happening with the, the broader LDS populace? Well, <clears throat> it's, it's a, a constantly involved in, in helping the poor, uh, taking care of children that are disadvantaged and, and uh, uh, may have various handicaps, just being in the game, helping in so many different ways. But, and the saints are involved in, uh, well, perhaps let me just share with you my favorite. My favorite in doing this was finding out about a stake president who was reading the, the, the paper one morning, Charles Johnson was his name, and he says to his wife, whom I interviewed, he says, he reads about the Evergreen Missionary Baptist Church. This is an African-American church on the west side of Vegas that some arsonist had burned it to the ground. And as he read it, he had a spiritual impression that he had to do something about it. So long story short, he went over, met with the pastor, Nathaniel Whitney, a good man of faith, and they just got Latter-day Saints and these wonderful black Baptist Christians side by side. And I thought to myself, what a wonderful thing to have that concept of just seeing each other as brothers and not judging uh, one another because of the, the color of our skin. But the end of that story is 
when the, the temple was announced in Vegas in 84. And at this time, they're, they're not only cleaning up, but they're helping raise funding for building the church and different people are, you know, coming in with uh, their, their equipment that they're donating and also their time. The minister, uh, Nathaniel Whitney, finds out that the Latter-day Saints are running into some, uh, you know, potential problem with, uh, with the zoning commission. So he finds out they're going to have this meeting down at City Hall and here comes Nathaniel Whitney, this wonderful African-American minister, to tell the city council uh, what these Mormons are really all about. Yeah, what they've done to yeah, him. Yeah, and, and it had an impact. But it's, you know, at the time that Charles Johnson went to help that Vegas state president, he wasn't trying to get anything out of it. But uh, cast your bread on the water, and the result was this wonderful backing, and they had things approved. And by November of 1989, we have a temple in Vegas. And now, you know, this past year, we've had another temple announced for Las Vegas. So this is just tremendous. And then that sets up kind of a perfect segue, because I do want to spend some time uh, talking about the the temple. Um, but before I do, and this, I, I, I promise I'm not getting any royalties for mentioning this, but the uh, um, the the video that goes along with this it's about a half hour is that right yes that's correct uh, and and it does a, a wonderful job of highlighting this experience that you just mentioned with that uh, Baptist church and then also the temple so maybe with that let's transition uh, help us understand the history of the the Las Vegas temple and some of the miracles that we saw with that process okay and let, let me just mention as a footnote to Ryan that to what you just said and thank you that uh, these documentary films I've mentioned today in this interview, these are free to the public. This is not a That's commercial. That's how I was able to afford it, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> you can watch it on uh, BYU TV. Yeah. But let's let's go back to your question about the temple. Why a temple in Vegas? Uh, President Hinckley was asked by the locals, uh, South um, Southern Nevada Press, why Vegas was selected as the place for a temple. This is going back to the you know, like 1984. And President Hinckley's honest response was, and I quote, he said, I don't know of any place in all the world that needs one more. <laughs> Isn't that uh, perfect, President Hinckley? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know of a place in the world where you see more clearly the contrast between evil and good than you do in this city. This place needs a temple. And then not to be negative, but I mean, let's face it, um, uh, there are Latter-day Saints and Latter-day Aints. You don't find Latter-day Aints in Las Vegas. It, like, I want to emphasize again, there's no gray—I mean, it's black and white, but it's—I uh, I think this is a significant point that those young people, they have to uh, take a stand. And so you see uh, far more Latter-day Saints than you see Aints that maybe you might find— and other places that I'll leave unnamed. So at this time, there were, at the time that the temple was announced, there's over 100,000 Latter-day Saints in the Vegas metropolitan area, and their size and commitment size and commitment to live the gospel was readily apparent, particularly with their payment of tithes. They also, you know, they had a certain amount they were to raise. They raised so much that President Hinckley had to just tell them that you it's, you need to we've stop. We've done enough. Stop. We've yeah. done enough, far more <laughs> uh, than they needed to. So one thing I wanted to mention too, Ryan, is that John Ryan, who's a was a journalist for the Las Vegas Sun and a local newspaper, he toured the Las Vegas Temple uh, just days before the dedication, but he'd also been to the opening of the Mega Mirage Hotel, you know, right downtown. And so he, he made this contrast. He'd been to both open houses, so to speak, and he wrote, There are two structures in Las Vegas. One, the Mirage, is indeed an impressive building, but for graceful beauty, there is the Las Vegas Nevada Temple. There you are transported to another world apart from the frenzied Las Vegas life. Now we have a great temple to share pride with its members. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Maybe just share with us uh, the comment President uh, Hinckley said. We we quoted him earlier. Uh, yeah, what did what did he say uh, after the dedication? Yeah, 
he made the comment that the day the temple was dedicated, he said, and I quote, never has there been so beautiful a day in Las Vegas as we dedicate the house of the Lord, the crowning jewel overlooking the city. And anybody that's been to Vegas knows what that looks like. Uh, so that's why bright lights in the desert, right? But it's not just the temple, it's those faces yeah. Uh, that are, you know, full of light and truth that are navigating their way through uh, the str some of the streets of Babylon, you know, in the Strip area. Yeah, yeah very good. Um, obviously, we've been talking about relevance of, of, what, of what you're saying uh, throughout this, this article, relevance of, of the, the book, the work that you've done, the influence of the Latter-day Saints uh, in, in the Las Vegas area. Um, in, any other maybe applications for our listeners who maybe don't live in Vegas? What what can we learn from some of these interviews that, that you've had and some of the work that you've done? Well, I think um, this book is relevant not only for Latter-day Saints in Las Vegas, but it's, it's I think, very relevant for any Latter-day Saint, particularly those living in the United States. But I also think it's relevant for our friends of other faiths, uh, regardless of where they live. Why? Because it's a powerful model of how the few can come together and join hands and really make a difference. So in a concerted uh, effort to assimilate into this desert community, together with like-minded friends, Latter-day Saints have They've improved neighborhoods. They've inspired educational institutions. They've brought integrity to the marketplace. They have provided wholesome entertainment, cultural refinement, family stability, and served in communities. And they found like-minded people to join hands with them. And so I think this is, this is so important. And maybe just another thought on this. Uh, the reason, one of the main reasons I want to do Saints by State is not only to just dope out the history for Latter-day Saints, but I'm very, very interested in how uh, the Latter-day Saint population in America, it's, it's about 2%, which is the same with Jews, right? And in the latest Pew study, it's showing that Jews have far more influence. And what I would like to do is to pull together from each state working with public affairs some of the highlights to show the tremendous influence that Latter-day Saints have had, although they're a very small percentage of each state. So let me just quote Latter-day Saint historian Patrick Mason, who said this, it's not inconceivable that the Mormons of 21st century America might become like the Jews of 20th, 20th century America, concentrated in numbers but disproportionately influential because of a, a core set of values that fosters an ethic of serving and transforming not just their internal religious community, but also the nation and the world. So one thing I think we're getting better at as Latter-day Saints is not just standing in a circle holding hands. That's great to be unified. But we need to look outside the circle, and we need to bring our Protestant, Catholic, Muslim, Buddhist friends, and whatever community we're, we're in, we want to be the ones leading out and making that community better regardless of— uh, our faith tradition, and I think that's what Just Serve is doing. They're doing a tremendous job of this very thing. It reminds me of a Latin maxim that I love that says, in the essentials let there be unity, and non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity. We're out looking for the, the, the common ground, not the battleground, so this is bright lights in the desert, the Latter-day Saints in Las Vegas, but they were not the only lights. I want to emphasize that there were good people of, uh, of faith, people, believing people that could see. That that's why one reason they wanted to elect those Latter-day Saint officials, because they had the same values. They cared about their kids in the schools. They cared about the community as a whole. And, and so I think this is a very important point and, and how we're, we want to join in and join hands with others. And so this is something that is driving me with this Saints by State project. It's not just bringing the attention to the history 
of uh, Latter-day Saints to our people, but it's also trying to not only so show what's been done, but really inspire people to do more for their communities. If you're interested in Professor Fred Woods' book, Bright Lights in the Desert, The Latter-day Saints of Las Vegas, published by the University of Nevada Press, we have included a link to that book in our show notes and on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu. We have also included a link to his BYU TV documentary by the same name that you can click on and watch, as well as an LDS Living article that he wrote on a similar theme. All right, we've arrived at our last segment, part three, where we like to discuss things more personally with the professor. In this final segment, Professor Woods tells us about his remarkable journey in joining the church as a convert, his academic training and career trajectory, why he became a religious educator at BYU in church history and doctrine, and why he is a person of faith in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, but in this last segment, we like to learn a little bit more about you, and you've sort of started taking us there anyway. Um, talk to us about your education and training. You mentioned uh, you you studied the Hebrew Bible. Uh, maybe tell us uh, what you studied, why you went that way, <laughs> and then maybe walk us through how you ended up here at BYU as a, a professor in religious education. So I, I grew up in Southern Cal. I spent too much time at the beach, had a 1.7 GPA coming out of high school. And uh, anyway, I ran into some Latter-day Saints on a construction job and uh, joined the church just shy of my 20th birthday. Then I went on to a mission to Australia, which I think was the very best education I've had from any any of my uh, secular training. That was uh and I mean that sincerely. What what a I needed that so much as a husband and a father, and just to get myself grounded. But anyway, upon returning home, I couldn't get into BYU with a you know 4.0 divided by two rounding up. <laughs> so my mission president wrote a letter to Rick's college uh, 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 saying one point seven. That's yeah. you almost have to try to do that, yeah. Fred. That's impressive. Yeah. But uh, he wrote a letter, you know, saying, you know, give this kid a chance. He's been, he's done okay as a missionary. And so I think I got a $300 scholarship. And uh, I went to Rick's College. And that was a tremendous area where I met my future wife, Joanna Merrill, who's been my, uh, my greatest support and also my chief editor. She's quite gifted at writing. But uh, so anyway, that I came back down to BYU, did a BS in psychology because I thought I wanted to go into counseling just to help people like people had helped me. Then I ended up doing an MA at BYU in international uh, studies. I had this global interest. And uh, then and I brought, up, brought on from the Australia experience or? Yeah, I think. And also it was an emphasis on Near Eastern studies. So I knew I wanted to go into uh, I, I knew from actually the very first discussion I had uh, with the missionaries, I asked them what I, how I could uh, do what they're doing for the rest of my life because I'd had a witness the night before the first time I ever entered the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I had a very powerful witness. And that next morning when I, the assistants were on their P day, they met with me. And I, when I met with them, I said, how can I do it? what you're doing for the rest of my life. And they said, you should be a seminary teacher. So anyway, years later after, um, you know, getting my bachelor's degree and things, I ended up teaching at Orem Seminary and uh, a bit at Temp View, taught in Southern California, seminaries and institutes. And then I ended up completing a PhD from University of Utah in the field of Middle East studies with an emphasis in Hebrew Bible. And I still, even though I'm teaching primarily in church history, I've taught for a number of years. I've taught Old Testament, but I felt like for me that the Lord wanted me to work more at trying to um, build the church now as opposed to studying the past, if that makes makes sense. So Yeah, absolutely. So, so all those years in seminaries and institutes, and then the jump to BYU. Help us understand 
uh, kind of what led you here and, and uh, some of your feelings about teaching here at BYU. Well, I love BYU, and my favorite thing about BYU is the students. And uh, Aside from I, working with me, of course. But that probably goes and the saying. faculty's yeah. fantastic. But uh, I, I had my eye at, on BYU. I, I knew that I wanted to uh, teach um, young single adults, and I felt like, you know, I, I was blessed. I feel like most... If you, if you were to interview most professors at BYU, I think they would have a story. And so I don't want to put myself above anyone else, but I do, uh, again, wanting to acknowledge the hand of the Lord. I have no doubt that the Lord, uh, his hand was in uh, this. I will just tell you, I was first interviewed to work in ancient scripture by Dean Andy Skinner. And I said, you know, I, I am so honored. I'd, I'd come down, I'd been invited to give a lecture on my uh, sail before the trail to have you missed the boat because of my St. Spicy research. And he said, oh, you know, we're not looking for anybody for a couple of years. And I said, that's good because I'm a, I'm a, um, a bishop, and I've only been a bishop a short time. And more importantly, I have a son that's a senior at Madison High School. And he said, well, let's just, you know, we can wait a little bit. Well, what I didn't know is that, um, long story short, my file was passed over to the church history mm -hmm. department, and I got a phone call of, you know, which one would you like to be? And I said, well, you know, uh, either one, I'm interested in both things. And um, then a few weeks later, I get a phone call that I had been, they looked at the portfolio, and uh, I had actually been hired in the Department of Church History and Doctrine, which isn't exactly as we do it today. But again, I think there were some things that happened along the way. But I felt like not only was the Lord's hand in coming to BYU, but particularly going to the Department of Church History rather than Ancient Scripture, which is now what I've been doing yeah. primarily with the global church as well as now saints by state. So everybody has their story, and uh, but but thank you for asking. Yeah, and and let me just kind of on that note. Obviously, you're you're engaged in a lot of really inter interesting projects. Anything else you want to say about some of the research you're doing that may be of interest for our listeners? Well. I think right now, uh, mostly it's the Saints by State project. I mean, this is a 10-year project. I've been into it, um, you know, nearly three years. But if you know of anybody, anybody listening, if you know of some of these riveting stories, like you'll see on BYU TV, uh, the documentary about Ivor Sandberg, a, a Swede and a Seed, I would love to know in your particular state or— um, you know, right here in our backyard of Utah, of significant conversion stories, and also people that really have a, a tremendous amount of understanding about uh, history in their, in their area. That yeah. would be so helpful. Very good. One final question. Uh, we, we'd love to get any kind of final thoughts you have on, on uh, your faith and your testimony, the restored gospel of the Savior. Uh, I'll just kind of give you the, the final words to, to share some of your thoughts and feelings. Yeah, well, I, I often tell people, whether they're LDS or not, I, I tell them I'm a hard-hitting academic, but I'm a praying professor. So whatever their faith tradition is, I just begin an interview by saying, could we have a word of prayer? So this is just a standard procedure. So with that, I want to just emphasize, again, I want to acknowledge the hand of God in shaping my life and in directing me in my research. I always tell students um, of the importance, particularly if they're going to graduate school, to sift their discipline through the gospel and not the gospel through their discipline. So for me, my covenants are more important than my publications. I do try to get beyond the reef and, and have respect. I think we should be bilingual, as President Kimball said. But um, I have a tremendous love for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm a convert. I, I don't just believe, but I know that Christ lives, and I know he directs his church through living prophets. I know it with every fiber of my being. And, and knowing these things, I often say to my students, you know, what Joseph said in section 120 to the Doctrine and Covenants, you know, knowing these things, shall we not go on in so great a cause? Courage, 
and on to the victory. And then I put in little ellipsis, and in the following verse it says, let the woods praise the Lord. And that's what I would say for myself and my family. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of Religious Education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, Professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, Ryan Sharp, and Hank Smith. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Alec Galloway. Say hi, Alec. Hi, guys. Original music and scoring for Why Religion podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.